Hello, welcome. My name is Stuart Evans. I'm a Distinguished Service Professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I've spent my entire academic career researching the notion of flexibility, so it's an honor and a privilege to be with you today to receive this prestigious award from GIFT that Professor Sushil and Professor Mayama have graciously awarded to me. I've prepared a couple of lectures on the notion of flexibility, the first going into the historical and conceptual foundations of the term, the second on how to apply that to companies in Silicon Valley and large companies around the world who are all seeking to go through this digital transformation. I've had a career spanning both academia and business. I've been at CMU for 10 years now. Prior to that, I was at the Judge Business School, uh, working with uh, Professor John Child, who was our PhD advisor. It was great to be back again and work together. Uh, before that, I was at the, the GSB at Stanford doing research on flexibility as a visiting scholar there. Prior to that, I had a, a spell in the, in the Valley as a venture capitalist and as an executive in a disk drive company. So I had first-hand experience in the trenches of what it's like to both research the notion of flexibility and hopefully to try and put it into practice effectively in, in companies. So this video is in two segments. In the first segment, I go into some of the conceptual foundations and historical origins of the notion of flexibility and how to integrate that into the notion of super flexibility, which is really a composite term that my co-researcher Dr. Homer Barami and I came up with to integrate the various features and nuances of flexibility that other researchers had uh, conducted. The second part is an interview uh, with Professor Barami on the practical aspects of how to execute and build flexibility into company strategies. And I try and look at the whole notion of the digital disruption and how people are trying to make that transformation right now and how people are trying to learn from the companies in Silicon Valley and what some of the lessons that are transferable and not transferable might be and how this relates to the notion of flexibility. The concept of flexibility sounds very simple, and it, its essence it is. It's about doing things differently when circumstances change. To actually put it into practice, however, is quite complicated and quite difficult. In the early days of military strategy, flexibility was seen as one of the seven principles of strategy that all generals looked to in the way that they fought wars, because the nature of warfare is such that conditions change, technology changes with weaponry, even the weather changes, which can have a massive impact on how a battle is fought or whatever. So for a long time, the concept of flexibility was used as a fundamental principle of military strategy. In business, however, the concept started to be used in the 1930s during the Great Depression, when a group of economists at the Chicago Business School under Frank Knight started examining this notion of being flexible as a way of trying to get out of the Great Depression, of, of the way that companies were not able to reinvent themselves or to change in accordance with the conditions of the time. And it was seen as a, as a weapon to sort of reignite business and get out of that Great Depression. And so two of those economists happened to win Nobel Prizes. One of them was a guy called George Stigler. And George had a very simple model of two production uh, units, one which had a a steep marginal cost curve and another one which had a, a smoother one. And if you looked at how output varied on these two plants, if you're an economist, you'd pick the one with the lowest marginal cost point. However, if the price fluctuated beyond the points, then the more expensive plant, which had a better curve, would be optimal in those situations. The model that Stigler proposed in, in the 30s is still strong today. One of his colleagues was a gentleman called Albert Hart. Albert Hart was looking at flexibility from the point of view of how anticipations drove a lot of the decisions that were made in business and how, uh, how an entrepreneur or a business person would think about how to plan a business. And so he brought in this notion of flexibility uh, along with, with Stigler when they were working with, with Frank Knight to see how as business conditions changed, a business would evolve accordingly. So here we found the first manifestation of the concept of flexibility applied to business. It was applied to business as a way of getting out of a crisis. And that 
kind of notion really became the bedrock of how scholars and, and, the, and the business world and the technology world viewed flexibility. And so it wasn't surprising that, that after, the, um, after the war, in the 50s, there was a, a, a big arms race, and so the uncertainty about weapons and how weapon systems would be developed was also an area where um, uh, many scholars looked at and tried to build in flexibility as a way of anticipating technological change. And <clears throat> there was a very famous paper from the Rand Corporation, from Klein and Meckling, talking about this whole notion of how you make decisions under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So again, we go back to this notion of flexibility being used in a crisis to try and find a way of doing things differently to get out of that situation. In the 60s, we had a very different situation come about because we had this white heat of technology change the way business was, and we went into a period of hypergrowth. In situations of hypergrowth, the problem of flexibility also comes up because you're moving at the speed of light and you just have to do things along the way to, to capitalize on the opportunity that's there. And so this theme now reoccurs from the 1960s through the boom cycles that we've had. Flexibility is seen as a, a valuable weapon to get out of a crisis. It's also seen as a very, very valuable capability to have during periods of, of hypergrowth. And so the notion of flexibility was used in conjunction with a number of other concepts that were viewed as partially synonymous, but not exactly so. So on the crisis side of things, there were a number of uh, environmental scientists. Um, Holling was probably the leading scientist among them, who was at Oregon and then went to Florida. And Holling had this notion of how we bring back a damaged ecosystem to its normal or natural state. And so he viewed flexibility in this situation as being synonymous with resilience, the idea of bouncing back when you've been injured, which is, again was a connotation that came out of seeing flexibility being used in times of crisis. So again, you have this notion of resilience being synonymous with flexibility. In the same way, there was an economist at the London School of Economics called Jonathan Rosenhead, who was looking at how you make decisions under uncertainty. And he brought in this notion of flexibility as somehow reflecting the robustness of a strategy. So if you look at a bundle of different strategies that might be available to you, and you try and evaluate how they might fare over time, you might want to pick a strategy that's going to be robust in a number of different scenarios that you're going to potentially experience. And that one will be able to withstand that, 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 that variety and do better. So again, this notion of flexibility was viewed as being synonymous with robustness. Now, the economic cycles have profound impacts on the relative uh, desirability of flexibility. When I was a PhD student many years ago, it was just after the first oil crisis. And there was a very uh, strong business strategist called Igor Ansoff, uh, who was then based in, 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 in Brussels. But he had written a lot about adaptive management and how you anticipate surprises and weak signals. And so he'd done a lot of work on flexibility. And one of his research students, Jan Epping, did a study of a number of firms to see how they're going to respond to the oil crisis, to the shock that was imposed on the system. And Epping really did some very interesting pioneering work on looking at different senses of flexibility and different ways that firms could respond to, to the oil crisis. Throughout this period, there were um, attempts to try and quantify flexibility, to come up with measures of flexibility. Most of these have failed because we can't always anticipate the future uh, to see the need and the desire and what things we need to change to become flexible. So in the 1980s, again, we had this period of growth in technology. Um, the, the computer industry really went into high gear. And so we saw a lot of desire, particularly in the software business, for agile software development. And a number of people equated flexibility with agility. Now, in times of hypergrowth, this notion of being agile was often viewed as being synonymous with flexibility. So you would see it come into play when you looked at the, the way that, that companies like IBM or Xerox evolved and how you build in flexibility to the evolution so they could better capitalize on, on, on the opportunities. 
And so, again, we have the notion of, on the one hand, this hyper growth where you need to be really quick, you need to be nimble, and you need to be agile. And again, on the other hand, you need this notion of resilience and robustness to be able to either withstand negative changes or be able to bounce back when you get knocked down and you get up again a, a, a and move on. So the notion of flexibility again came into vogue when there was financial crisis and people were trying to, to adapt. But in the software industry, this notion of agile software development really kicked into gear in, in, in 2001, 2002 with the Agile Manifesto. And that made a profound impact on the software industry, but it stayed dormant for a long time because software at the time, uh, the turn of the century, was important, but it, it, it didn't have the significance that it has in the current era where software is really redefining the way that the, the world works. So around the turn of the century, this notion of agility became very important. Um, there, are, there are many scholars that have contributed to this notion of flexibility, and each of them have come with a different uh, take on how, it, how, it, how, it, how you can actually become flexible. Um, each one is kind of like attacked a little microcosm of, of the whole equation. So in order to try and move forward on this, uh, Homer Barami and I came up with this idea of let, let's integrate all these different notions of flexibility and, and the different concepts that uh, are often viewed as synonymous but not quite uh, into a term called super flexibility. So when we wrote the book on super flexibility, we really tried to come up with what this notion of flexibility was, and we came up with this idea of an arc or a spectrum of flexibility. So flexibility on the one hand is about transforming to take care of opportunities, and it's also about withstanding to maintain your integrity while the world around you changes. There are a number of terms in between these extremes, and these can range from hedging, where you hedge your bets like a squirrel looking for its nuts, or a camel that has a hump to hold water if it's moving into a situation where it's not sure it can find water. And so there are a number of other terms like malleability, like liquidity, like plasticity. Um, so for example, in plasticity, a lot of neuroscientists look at the development of the brain in terms of of, of, of phenotype plasticity, how organisms evolve and learn from their environment. And so we incorporate this notion of plasticity uh, into, into the scene. There was a very uh, interesting contribution uh, by a scholar called Sanchez who argued that modularity is, is, a, is a way of getting flexibility by having units like Lego bricks that you can quickly assemble into something bigger and you can also disassemble them as the cycle kind of moves and you, you, you move from growth to consolidation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This notion of agile software development and working in a different way to the top-down planning uh, process which was, which was prevalent in most strategic planning systems really came into its own in Silicon Valley. And it was in Silicon Valley where Homer and I came uh, 40 years ago now to, to work, where we saw a very different way of, of, of building companies and, and creating innovations. Uh, the Valley at the time was just about to go through the PC revolution, and so we saw the first cycle, the very rapid cycles that Silicon Valley have gone through of, of boom and bust. Uh, we were able to observe that. And in the Valley, this notion of agility uh, that people had alluded to in software development, because many of the companies were built by engineers, has become a mantra which oftentimes is viewed as the reason why Silicon Valley is so innovative. So this notion of agility to deal with the business cycles and the, and the, and the clock speed of innovation in Silicon Valley is something that's evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. And now in the last two years, the clock speed of innovation has increased to the point where big companies can't keep up with it anymore. And this digital disruption that we're experiencing right now is also hard for many startups to keep up with. And so in this period of significant adaptation, it's important to think about flexibility as a really strong uh, mechanism to enable the fluid and frictionless movement as you adapt. And the name of the game now, flexibility, is really 
the mechanism. It's really the secret source of Silicon Valley, but it's a mechanism to allow continuous dynamic adaptation to change. And that really is what flexibility is all about, how you dynamically adjust to change. Stuart, you've been an active researcher in the area of flexibility, going back to your PhD work uh, in, in England. What we seek to do with the notion of super flexibility is to unify all these different dimensions into one concept that we can make actionable. So perhaps you can describe what super flexibility means. You said there are 12 or 13 different concepts and definitions. How would you say super flexibility unifies all these constructs? Um, well, it's, it's a very convenient way of hacking all of these different constructs into one construct. Uh, unification really requires a conceptual framework that we've developed to show the operational way that you achieve flexibility, which is different in different situations. So there's no one kind of panacea for this equation will give you flexibility. It depends on the situation very much that you're dealing with and the type of capabilities you have at your disposal. But to become super flexible, is really essential because the speed of change has increased so rapidly in the last three or four years <clears throat> and the rise of this digital transformation that most big corporations are having to go through is so complex that no one recipe for doing that has really emerged as a way to do it. So going back to what we said about the what super flexibility is and how you achieve it, there's no one size fits all. There's no ubiquitous equation that you can say, this gives you flexibility. It depends on the situation that you find yourself in. In essence, it's about dynamic adaptation. And the reason that dynamic adaptation is more important now, it's always been important in Silicon Valley. It's the secret source of Silicon Valley. But now it's become the secret source of how large companies can make this digital transformation because Technology is changing. It's not a step functional change that everybody's going through. It's a continuous change. And so the business world in general is now becoming like the business world of Silicon Valley. And the same recipes now apply to big companies that have applied to the successful companies in Silicon Valley. So I know you work with several major corporations that are going through uh, digital transformation and they want to make their enterprises more flexible. Could you give us a sense of some of the pain points and the challenges that they're experiencing as they're trying to make themselves mm -hmm. uh, super flexible and incorporate flexibility into their systems? Sure, I think the biggest pain point that most large organizations suffer from when they're trying to become flexible uh, is the rigid sort of silos of their organization. Because as an organization moves through time and is going through these transformations, it needs to shift gears and, and, and move, but it needs to do it in harmony. And the existing approaches to organizational structure have very siloed ways of organizing, which when you try and get that cross-functional alignment, doesn't allow them to move together. And so that's one of the key problems. The other problem is, is technology. Te this, the clock speed of technological innovation is, is so rapid now that many big companies have tried to come to Silicon Valley to emulate and to learn from how companies in Silicon Valley work. That's quite complex. Uh, Silicon Valley, while it might look easy from the outside, is very, very hard. There's a really high failure rate that can't be tolerated inside of large companies. They're not used to experimenting the same way. And so one of the key problems that I see in many large organizations is they try and pick the winners as opposed to have a portfolio which have probabilistic chances of success and whose success may not be obvious at first, but downstream may become very successful the way many Silicon Valley companies operate, for example. I know that you, you have developed this framework so that big corporations can really think about their different initiatives as a portfolio. Perhaps you can tell us about the different aspects of that portfolio. What is the nature of that framework? Yes, I'd be delighted to. I think that typically when you change, there's some kind of triggering episode that causes you to want to do something differently. The triggering episode behind this digital transformation has been this idea that you could be disrupted by a startup. And so the paranoia of that has driven a lot of activity in many co companies. That, that paranoia has, uh, has subsequently uh, receded as it's not that easy to disrupt an airline or to disrupt a, a bank or uh, some kind of capital intensive uh, 
business, so it's a little difficult. But these triggering events historically have been viewed as step functional, where there's a long period of equilibrium, there's some change, and then you go back into a period of stability. That's changed. The idea that the English economist Shackle brought about was how kaleidoscopic change happens. So where you have a small change in one part of the system that totally changes the whole picture. So these triggering episodes now are not just one tiny little event or one thing, it's a complete complexion change over time. And so you can either anticipate what these triggering events are. For example, right now, the, most of the automotive companies are looking at autonomous vehicles as a big area because self-driving vehicles are a reality now. It's going to be a big change, and they're gearing up for that. Other times, you have no idea of how quickly the change is going to come along. Uh, like Airbnb, for example, renting out your room to strangers was something that you wouldn't conceive of a while ago, but now it's, it, it's the norm. And so. <clears throat> You can either anticipate these changes, or you can react once these changes have, have occurred. Most times, companies are very defensive in the way that they, they, they act. And so they have a change inflicted upon them, and then they're trying to fix it, either protect themselves ahead of time or correct it if they, if they miss it. So protective and corrective actions are part of the portfolio. Most of the companies in Silicon Valley, the entrepreneurs are really on the offense. They're really looking to seek advantages. They're really trying to find a new opportunity. They're trying to build a new big company. And so if you want to do that ahead of these triggering events, the best thing to do is to bring about the triggering event, to precipitate that by being preemptive. And being preemptive is probably the highest form of, of the super flexibility that you can achieve. And probably the best example of that right now is a company just down the street from here called Uber, where they've totally transformed the taxi business. Um, so that preemptive side of things is the highest payoff. Other times, companies find themselves in opportunistic situations after these triggering events have occurred, and they need to take advantage of them. They have to exploit them very quickly. And so that's the other quadrant. So if you think of the triggering episode at the center of, of, of a matrix, you can either react before or after that. You can act defensively or offensively. And the four aspects of the portfolio, the types of, of activity you can engage in, a preemptive activity to bring about the triggering episode, protective activity to insulate yourself, to immunize yourself against future changes. You can also correct after the fact you've missed out. So Lowe's, for example, has really done a very great job of getting itself technologically sophisticated with, with robots in, in, in their stores and things like that to get back into the game. From an opportunistic point of view, you see many companies exploiting the situation that they have for themselves uh, as, a, as a key goal. But how you exploit an opportunity, how you correct a mistake, how you protect yourself from the potential impacts of, of a harmful change, or how you preempt and bring about change, they're the four quadrants of this matrix that I think companies can use to come up with an approach to dealing with uncertainty and to become super flexible. And you know, one of the challenges that certainly I see with big companies, as you said before, is they try to pick the winner. They try to come up with the golden goose that's going to lay the eggs. And I think what you're proposing is your framework is an opportunity for them to allocate different initiatives to different parts of the portfolio. Some activities that are preemptive, uh, some activities that are protective, some that are opportunistic after the fact, and some that are corrective. Absolutely. Would that be a fair way of summing it up? Absolutely. And you've got to always be doing things that are preemptive. That's the name of the game. I remember when I was doing my research at, at the GSB at Stanford, I spoke to a founder of a disk drive company. And he said, look, you always have to be preemptive no matter what you're doing, and then selectively engage in the other things as a portfolio of activities. But the portfolio that you're recommending, I think, has got implications for innovation, too. And, and the key problem that many large companies are having is, is how to innovate. What Silicon Valley works on are a portfolio approach. There'll be a 1,000 startups for every two that work to become big companies. And so when you deal with that kind of variety and that breadth of experiments, you embrace a very different range of uncertainties in, in that spectrum. And so large companies can't afford, obviously, to do a thousand experiments. But instead of trying to pick the silver bullets for the future, it's much better to have a portfolio of activities that can be pruned regularly as circumstances change.
So uh, to sum up, what is your advice? Um, let's say a corporate executive uh, whose organization is going through digital transformation, they're feeling the impact of disruptive innovations. What would be your suggestions? What do you suggest they think about uh, as they try to make their enterprises super flexible? I think they need to understand that the world is going to keep changing. And so instead of doing what we traditionally have done is, is fix the problem with a solution, we need to come up with a process of continuously dealing with change rather than dealing it with it as a one-off activity. That's the most important thing. And so when you can't predict the future with any certainty, you have to take a very different approach. And because of the high failure rate in Silicon Valley, that notion of trying to predict how things are going to unfold is really being superseded by this idea of experimenting, seeing the evidence of your own eyes, and where you see potential traction and momentum, invest heavily in it. And so that's the other piece of advice that I would give large corporations. Many come to Silicon Valley and work with startups, and it's very, very difficult for an early stage startup that's got five or 10 young people in it to work with a 200,000 person global organization. And that's maybe good for the innovation lab, but to actually make a difference to the business quickly, I think it's way better to work with Series C companies, Series D companies, where they've got two or 300 people so they can make an impact quickly and then assess that impact to see if it is meeting the expectations before escalating further. So it's again the evidence of your own eyes, seeing whether something works or it doesn't work. Thank you very much. I very much hope you enjoy the lectures. I wish I could be with you in person. Uh, I'd love to have conversations with you. GIFT is a pioneering organization that's pushing the research into flexibility into the forefront. Uh, thank you again for this prestigious award and I hope the conference goes well and I look forward hopefully to meeting many of you in the future.